אבל מה עם האנשים חפים מפשע שפשוט גרו פה? לא חפים מפשע. אין... גוי אין לו רשות להחזיק אדמה של ארץ ישראל. אתה רוצה שלום? שלום, אם היה עם מי לעשות שלום, הוא היה שלום. שלום אבל שיהיה... אין ערבי שאפשר לעשות איתו שלום בארץ ישראל. שילכו מחוץ לארץ ישראל, שם יהיה איתם שלום. אז אין אפשרות לשלום פה במדי... לא. פה בארץ ישראל. שום אפשרות. וכשאתה מתכוון לארץ ישראל, אתה מתכוון לגבולות של 67' או אתה מתכוון מהנהר עד הים? מהנהר עד הים, כל ארץ ישראל. אז מה אנחנו אמורים לעשות עם הארץ? צריך לגרש שמתי? אותם, את כולם. עוד פעם? לגרש את כל הערב. I also am an organization, it's called Lahava, it's against the Jews who marry Arabs. Did you say the organization was, did what again? We, the organization, the organization is, the, the thing of it is to, that Jews should marry Arabs. Shouldn't marry Arabs, why do you feel strongly about that? Because Jews is a special nation that God gave it to the Jews and we don't want Jews to get mixed up with it, together with a different nation. Okay. בסדר בעברית? פשוט מאוד, צריך להיכנס לשטחים וכל מחבל שעושה פיגוע צריך להרוג אותו, צריך להרוג את המחבלים ואז הם יפחדו ולא יעשו לנו בעיות והכל יהיה בסדר, הם יהיו בכפרים שלהם אנחנו נחיה פה, לא צריך להיות ביחד, והכל בסדר. I'm saying that we need to... איך אומרים לה איש לערבים? כן, כן, תגידי לי את המילה הזאת. נו, תגידי לי מילים, אני לא... אני לא יודעת לתרגם. I don't know how to translate. I think that the Jews came here, they took it... They took this land and this is our land now and I don't think there should be here no Arabs. <laughs> like Arabs, they want, we gave them Gaza, so they should go live there quietly if they want. They should go back to Iraq, to, I don't know, to wherever they want. But this is a place, this is a place that God gave it to the Jews and we don't want the Arabs to be here. I think that uh, we're miserable, the, the Arabs, uh, we need to kill the uh, Arabs. <laughs> אוקיי. To learn their stories, you must go back to a year that none in the region will ever forget, though some have tried. It's a black hole. I, want, I don't want to think about it. The feeling of you have a state of your own, a Jewish state, oh, no one can, no one have ever lived such a situation. It's such a grave injustice. And that is really uh, what, what hurts you. It's a grave injustice that has not been at all attended to and taken care of. Uh, only when I answered your question, I knew about it. Yes. I know that I don't want to think about the 48. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict can seem impossible to comprehend. By looking at the year that most changed the lives of Israelis and Palestinians, 1948, it becomes possible to understand the forces that drive this conflict today. For Israelis, 1948 was a year of creation. The terrible injustices Jews had faced throughout the world would finally come to an end with the realization of their long sought after solution, a Jewish state in Palestine. For Palestinians, 1948 was a catastrophe. That one year saw the destruction of hundreds of Palestinian villages and towns, their inhabitants replaced by outsiders from Europe and Russia, and most Palestinians would never see their home again. 
1800s, Jews across Europe and Russia suffered persecution in many forms. Racial stereotypes of Jews were rampant. Movements called for boycotting Jewish businesses. In many places, Jews were not allowed to attend universities, were forced to live in certain neighborhoods, and were prevented from entering roles in government. In other places, whole towns would rise up against their Jewish populations and attack them en masse, resulting in looting, robbery, rape, and massacres. Jews began to look for a way to end their suffering. Some came up with the idea to bring all of the Jewish people out of Europe and settle in a place where they could finally be secure. The place they chose was Palestine, and the movement formed at the end of the 19th century became known as Zionism. Greater Syria was a major region of the Middle East at the turn of the 20th century. It became part of the Ottoman Empire in 1516 and remained Ottoman until the end of the First World War in 1918. Greater Syria's southern province, Palestine, was an active part of the Ottoman world. Trade boomed in its commercial centers, which included Jerusalem, Jaffa, and Haifa. Philistine is the westernmost of the provinces of Syria. In its greatest length, from Rafah to the boundary of El Lejun, it would take a rider two days to travel over, and a like time to cross the province in its breadth from Jaffa, Jaffa, to Riha, or Jericho. El Jibal and Ashcharikh being two separate provinces that lie in contiguous one to the other are included in Philistine and belong to its government. Philistine is watered by the rains and the dew. Its trees and its plowed lands do not need artificial irrigation. And it is only in Nablus that you find the running waters applied to this purpose. Philistine is the most fertile of the Syrian provinces. Its capital and largest town is Ar Ramla, but the holy city of Jerusalem comes very near this last in size. In the province of Philistine, despite its small extent, there are about 20 mosques with pulpits for the Friday prayer. Now this passage was written by al maqdisi a 10th century Arab geographer, and his description of Philistine, Palestine, establishes uh, an identity for the territory which was known to the Arabs and Muslims of the time and has persisted in the same identity uh, to the present day. And it's known by Palestinians and indeed all Arabs as occupying precise borders of uh, the territory we call Palestine and that Al-Maqdisi calls Palestine. Some Christian and Zionist Jewish writers describe Palestine as, quote, a land without a people. منذ قرنين وأكثر وأكثر والحركة الصهيونية المسيحية غير اليهودية ابتدأت قبل الصهاينة اليهود بالادعاء إنه فلسطين لا يوجد فيها أحد شراذم بدو شراذم فلاحين لا يوجد شعب ولا يوجد حضارة لا يوجد زراعة والإزاء والأخبار أنه لا يوجد شيء في فلسطين يستحق الذكر هذا سبق حتى ما ولد أرزل هذا الكلام فلسطين كان فيها شعب كان فيها شعب نشيط فعال منتج مفكر مبدع I think that the Zionist success in Palestine was was premised on the notion that there was no one in Palestine or if there was they weren't worth bothering about and certainly the case that the Zionists made to the west was was essentially uh, as Israel Zangwill put it that it was a people without land going to a land without people. And that, that slogan caught it very neatly. So that the, the, the Palestinians who were obviously there and were in fact seen, I mean, they couldn't have not been seen, and they were even seen in some of the films and pictures of the time, and even descriptions of the time, were almost always treated not as a people, capital A, capital P, but as inconsequential nomads, as miscellaneous peasants, as people without any important identity or attachment to the land. 
they were, uh, as, uh, as one of the early Zionist uh, settlers in the 20s put it, they were like the rocks of Judea that could be removed. They were an obstacle, but they could just be put aside, and they had pretty much the consciousness of rocks. In other words, not very much. Clearly, the missionaries would have told the Zionists at the time that there are a people in Palestine. And therefore, the Zionists came up with the answer, yes, there are a people in Palestine, but they are backward. Uh, they are uh, nomads, they are Bedouins, and therefore the act of Jewish settlement in Palestine would in fact be beneficial to these people, so they are not out to hurt the people, they are actually were out to benefit them, much in the same way that European imperialist powers were selling their idea of civilizing the Afro-Asian, which justified the whole idea of colonial control of the Afro-Asian world. So in that sense, the Zionists shared with the Europeans an attitude of superiority based on a very deep sense of racism. We were Zionists. We were, uh, we were <laughs> for, building a, for building a homeland. Well, what the Jews did, Jews did in their little circles and societies abroad, which promoted Zionism as it came to be called, is they gathered some money and then they sent off a family or a group of 20 people or whatever to Palestine. They bought little chunks of land and established small settlements. Europeans had been colonizing land across the globe for centuries, and Zionism would follow in that tradition. But there was a problem a problem that was overlooked by a popular Zionist slogan about Palestine. A people without land for a land without people. Okay, so they wanted to give the Jews a land because they didn't have land. But the problem is that the land they gave them had people. It was inhabited by Palestinians for thousands of years. When Zionist settlers began arriving in the 1880s, the Palestinian population already numbered around 450,000 Arabs and 20,000 Jews. Kanu al-Yahud mawjudin Yahud haqiqiyin min al-Yahud illi ghair mutatarrifin, yani kanu mustaqimin wa kanu ya'rifu innu ana ili haqq inni a'ish hon mithl ma ilu huwa haqq i'ish hon. لما اجوا هذول تبعين الغرب هن اللي خربوا الدنيا وهجرونا. During World War I, the Zionist movement scored a major victory. The British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour declared support for the creation of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. A few weeks later, the British Army conquered Jerusalem and began implementing the Balfour Declaration. The terms of the mandate given to the British by the League of Nations were intended to encourage self-government, and elsewhere this happened. But in Palestine, the Balfour Declaration was enshrined in the terms of the mandate, committing Britain to securing the establishment of the Jewish national homeland in Palestine. The arrival of the first High Commissioner, Sir Herbert Samuel, was marked by protests amongst the Arabs. To the Palestinians, the mandate not only denied them the right to independence, but also legitimized the claims of another people to their land. And when the mandate was imposed on Palestine, uh, we call it a mandate, I mean, that's another euphemism you know, for colonial control. I mean, the British imposed their colonial control in the wake of its, the, the actual military occupation of Palestine. Uh, and regardless of the promises they have made to the Arabs, Let's forget about that. Uh, in the pursuit of the Sykes-Picot agreement and all the agreements they have made with European powers, they obviously intended to divide the Arab world, to control it, distribute it between it and France, and to establish in Palestine the Jewish national homeland. The history of the Palestinians was now bound up with British imperial policy. Their future was set on a course they neither wanted nor were consulted upon the consequences were to be increasingly bitter.
In the early years of the movement, calls for removing Arabs from Palestine were not often made publicly by Zionist leaders. But as larger and larger groups of Jews began arriving in the country, discussions about encouraging the native population to leave by purchasing their land or through other means began to spill into the open. In the 1920s, thousands of Arabs became homeless after Zionists purchased their land out from under them by making deals with wealthy landlords from nearby countries. The rise of Hitler in the 1930s led to a massive increase in Jewish immigration to Palestine. The Arabs watched the arrival of more and more Zionists, saw the growing number of those who had lost their homes, and heard pronouncements by some Zionist leaders that they had plans to one day outnumber the Arabs. The Arabs revolted. In 36, 39, they revolted against the British and against the Zionist presence. The leadership of the Zionist movement and the leadership of the Palestinian Arab population. They both have made the same diagnosis of their situation, and this is what they understand, that the establishment of any type of Jewish state in any part of Palestine, where there was going to be a Jewish majority, necessarily required the large-scale displacement of Palestinian Arabs. Early Zionism thought you can actually buy the Palestinians out. You can buy um, bits of the land here, you push them out, gradually you push them into Transjordan. By the mid-30s, the key figures within the leadership realized the only way to do it is to do it on a mass scale, to engineer it. In 1940, Yosef Weitz wrote in his diary, the only way is to transfer the Arabs from here to neighboring countries. All of them, except perhaps Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Old Jerusalem. Not a single village or a single tribe must be left. In Palestine, even before World War II began, it was clear that war was on the horizon. After crushing the Arab revolt and exiling the leaders of the Arab community, the British decided to take some action to address the concerns of Arabs in Palestine. And this pushed the British into gradually stopping Jewish immigration. What this meant to the Jews was that the path of achieving statehood through majority, through gaining a Jewish majority here, was blocked. At the time, there were two Zionist militias in Palestine. The Haganah was far larger and better equipped, but the Irgun was more radical. The Irgun refused to accept the British decision to restrict immigration into the country. So we started to fight against them. My father was at the doorstep of the building and looked at his watch and he said, it's too early now, I'm going to come and have lunch at the YMCA anyway. Just as soon as he left, he hardly got away, a kilometer away, and the building was gone. The King David Hotel was the headquarters of the British government in Palestine. Its bombing in 1946 by the Irgun was by far the largest attack in the Zionist campaign against the British and was a massive shock to Palestine. It left 91 people dead, including Britons, Arabs, and Jews. My mother came to us and she said, go on your knees, go on your knees and thank the Lord that your father was spared. In the 1940s, the Haganah began preparing for the coming war with the Arabs by creating files on the hundreds of Arab villages and neighborhoods across Palestine. We used to, to spy, you might call it, on the Arab villages around to prepare ourselves for the day in which we knew will come. When the British leave, then the fight will not be against the British, but between the Jews and the Arabs. So we used to build up files of pictures and details about the villages so they can be attacked when the point will come. And as uh, the age of 18, even less 17, I was already part of such an operation. At the UN, a committee decided that the best way forward was to split Palestine in two, giving one state to the Jews and the other to the Arabs. Jerusalem would become a separate entity administered by the UN. The Jewish community in Palestine had skyrocketed throughout the Zionist movement. 
but in 1947, it still only represented one-third of Palestine's population and owned less than 7% of the land. The United Nations Partition Plan called for giving 56% of the country to the Jewish state. This proposal shocked the Arab community. Not only would the Jews receive over half of Palestine, but they were also receiving most of the land suitable for farming. Nobody felt that this was a fair, uh, fair uh, deal. The overwhelming majority, uh, more than 55% of a country that had a two-thirds Arab majority, was being given over to the minority. And the area that would have been given to the minority was almost equal in population between Arabs and Jews. So there was a negative reaction to the partition of the country at all. People felt it's a single country, it shouldn't be partitioned. But then the specifics of the partition were found uh, unjust and unequal in the uh, minority was being given most of the country. But in the wake of the Holocaust, world leaders felt compelled to do something for the Jewish people. In the United States, President Truman was facing re-election and intense lobbying by Zionist leaders. As a result of those pressures, he began supporting the UN partition plan. Truman, you might say, unleashed American diplomats to threaten certain countries. So you change your vote or else. And it worked. The vote passed to have partition. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Partition passed, 33 to 13. And is this crowd excited? They're starting their horror dances now. All over the square, little circles are forming. People are laughing and crying and shouting and whirling around in the wild horror dance. The only time I remember in my life that I really seen a total happiness. I mean, everyone was dancing and everyone was happy. And, uh, because it was a uh, uh, dream fulfilled. The feeling of the whole I was I disliked it from the beginning. I disliked it. And they said, we are not going to accept this, we're going to fight. Because this is our country and we're not going to leave it. بدنا سلاح نقاوم فيه صار كل واحد يتبرع باللي عنده فكنا نطلع على الجبل نقابل وين بطريق يطلعوا منها اليهود علينا وانا من الناس اللي اخذوا بارود طليانية مع خمس فشكات Now when we came to a village and then was was a barrier of stones I, I was afraid. I had all a bus on my responsibility. Then they began to try to to climb on there, and I shot. I shot, and I hit maybe three, four. I don't know how many. إجت مجموعة يهود ودخلوا على البلد في الليل ولغموا بيوت ونسفوهن وقتلوا أهلهن ومن هناك بدأت المعركة بين أهل البلد وبينهم يعني فصاروا البلد أهل البلد يشتغوا على السلاح فهم ويقاوموا. Because the British ran the government of Palestine, neither the Jews nor the Arabs had an official army. However, by 1947. The Haganah, the militia of the mainstream Zionist parties, had become a well-developed force of 35 to 40,000 fighters, nearly four times more than the poorly equipped Arab militias. The British had announced that they would complete the evacuation of Palestine on the 15th of May. Zionist leaders began preparing for a Jewish state. On March 10th, the Haganah adopted Plan Dalit, also known as Plan D. This plan outlined an overall strategy for the Jewish militia. Its stated goal was to prepare the coming Hebrew state to defend itself once the British army had left. But historians strongly disagree about the intentions of the plan. It's geared, and it says that it's geared, to securing the Jewish state and the border areas and the main roads between the Jewish urban concentrations to securing the Jewish state in advance of the Arab invasion. 
It's completely ridiculous. I mean, it's very clear that Plan Dalet was a plan not just to take over, but to empty of their population all of these villages and cities. Now, were there people who understood that writing down on paper, we will expel this population, was probably not a wise thing to do? Yes. But was there a clear intention implemented to the letter to expel the populations, and more importantly, not to let them return? There was. The most important part of Plan D was the set of orders that came outside of Plan D. The orders were uh, strikingly clear and unambiguous and used the word letaher in Hebrew, which is to cleanse or to uh, destroy, which is the Hashmid, or to expel, which is the Garesh. I think the role of the historian is to fuse these military orders with the plan itself. Uh, and then you get an, an idea of the intention and the implementation. Under Plan D, the Haganah began organizing large-scale military operations. The first, Operation Nachshon, took place over two weeks in April. The goal of Nachshon was to end attacks on Jewish convoys by clearing out Arab villages on the road to Jerusalem. The villages were defended in most cases by forces, maybe 30 people, 40 people, who were not trained, who were not organized, uh, were not defended by any trenches or things like that. And the conquest in all the places that I participated was an easy game. Lay the Arab village of Deir Yassin. Early in the morning of April 9th, the same day as the funeral of al Husseini, fighters from the Irgun set out for the village. Deir Yassin was one of many Arab villages that had signed a peace agreement with a neighboring Jewish village, so they did not expect an attack. The Haganah intelligence officer who reported on Deir Yassin was Mordechai Gichon. Deir Yassin were only citizens. The village was completely peaceful. Akhoui Rahmatullah Ali Mahmoud darab sim'a al-sawt wa la darab min akhar min talaq. A number of Arabs died resisting the attack, but a far larger group lost their lives well after the battle had ended. In all, Jewish fighters killed about 110 Arabs at Deir Yassin, most of them women, children, and the elderly. People were mutilated. Hand grenades were simply thrown in the houses. Women and children were killed, bodies stuffed down wells, jewelry stripped off fingers, fingers cut off, earlobes cut off. شفت هالمنظر ما تمش فيها حيل من مرة يعني بعدين مسكوا الأب حطوا وراه قالوا له الحق ابنك أنا جيت عديت قلت هل بيمسكوني ومت أركض After the massacre they took the people which remained they took them in a, in a car and, and went through Jerusalem. Irgun trucks full of survivors paraded up and down streets in Jewish neighborhoods. Spectators mocked, spit at, and even stoned the villagers. It was uh, very ugly. After these things, I, I did not know if I, if I am a Zionist. After the attack, the Haganah sent men to cover up the atrocities. 
they came to me and gave me a platoon of soldiers, some soldiers, and uh, told me, go there and make order. And so I came there and I was shuddering because I see how the uh, dead were strewn and they were eating uh, sandwiches with uh, marmalade. For some time I couldn't eat marmalade after that. And then I told them, look here, I'm going to fire and shoot and kill you if you don't clean this up. And so they made the graves and buried them and a few they threw in a well and um, everything was apparently clean. And then everything looked uh, peaceful. But the massacre was not over. Some villagers remained in Daryasin, hiding in their homes. For two days, Irgun fighters searched for survivors. Most of the images of the Der Yassin massacre are in the archives of the Israeli army. The archive refuses to release many of the images and intelligence reports on Der Yassin, despite being well past the 50-year embargo for classified documents. Uh, looking back, I'm still, after all those years, very much shocked. And I feel it is a disgrace on the uh, Jewish state and of the uh, Israelis. The كانت هي الحافظ الأكبر للكرة اللي تشرد وتهرب بولادها وأطفالها وبناتها ونسوانها قالوا أخذوا البنات يعني آه وفضعوا فيهن وسووا كذا وعملوا كذا هذا اللي خلانا إحنا نشرد The massacre at Dar Yassin was far from the only massacre of the war but it was the most widely publicized تسمع كل الكرة في مذبح الدير ياسين دير ياسين دير ياسين معركة دير ياسين مزدرب دير ياسين دير ياسين أحداث دير ياسين By far the most massacres, rapes, atrocities, etc. were committed by Israelis, particularly after 1948 uh, independence, then by Palestinians or by Arabs. My name is Yaakov Ode from Lefta village, refugee from Lefta village, uh, evicted in 1948. Lefta resident, 1948-3000. They were living in uh, more than more than 400 stony houses. You are welcome to Lifta. Always I used to say, I, I hope in the future you will come to our house in Lifta and drink a cup of coffee or tea or to eat Zatar Zit. You are welcome. It's a village uh, that was ethnically cleansed in late 1947, early 1948. It was one of the first, and 
Ben Gurion even sort of crowed publicly about how Lifta and Romema were now, you know, emptied of Arabs, and he hoped the same would happen in the rest of the country. The Lifta men did not left the village till Deir Yassin. When Deir Yassin massacre happened, uh, all the people left it, and the, the gangs, the Zionist armed gangs, get down looking for uh, in each house. So no one left here or uh, remained in the village. We went yani, in the truck only by our clothes. Nothing, we took nothing. And the key was with my father because we are coming back tomorrow. Yani, most of the people, we are coming tomorrow, but we yani, left because Fire, the fire, the shooting or killing or the fearful. Until now we are coming back, back, but I'll not lose the hope that we will come back. Now, and this is the most important and crucial point here, the prevention of return home of civilians is a political decision. This uh, doesn't have, uh, it's not exactly a, a result of the war, it's mainly a result of a political decision. The Jewish offensive continued. The normal procedure was that the Haganah would begin uh, by a short barrage of uh, either light mortars or three inch mortars. Uh, most of these villages were within Titus orchard, so we could come closer by going between the trees of the orchards. As we deployed the width of the front with my platoon say, in front of the houses, we gave a one minute coordinated shot of whatever weapons we had and stormed. And in at least two or three of these places, when we came into the houses, there was nobody there. There was still coffee on the pot. You could see people lived there until a few minutes ago. They ran into the orchards and hid there, and waited to see what happens. And if they tried to come back, they were shot at. Haifa was the second largest city in Palestine, and its port served as the main exit point for the evacuating British army. So there were a large number of British troops there. On April 19th, the British decided to pull out of downtown Haifa. Just hours after the withdrawal was complete on the 21st, the Haganah went into action. The operation, with its very ominous name, uh, cleansing the leaven. Leaven is the bread that is left before Passover. And as a Jew, you are supposed to clean even the last crumb. Now, if you apply it to people, you understand that the idea is to cleanse every person who lived in Haifa. The Jewish attack on Haifa was accompanied by a massive, indiscriminate bombardment by mortars. The Haganah also used loudspeaker trucks to broadcast recordings of shrieks, gunfire, explosions, and calls to flee for your lives. This tactic was used in many places by Jewish militias in 1948. <laughs> In Haifa, the Jewish attack continued. Unlike in other towns and villages, Haifa's mayor, Shabtai Levi, actually pleaded with the Arabs to stay. And he said, don't leave, stay here. We want you here. You belong here. Don't leave. But there's no reason for them to believe him. So you had one person pleading for them to say, but what they were hearing from all sides, and they had little to defend themselves with, was that they were going to be massacred. This British intelligence report describes the attack on Haifa. There was considerable congestion outside the East Gate of hysterical and terrified Arab women and children and old people, on whom the Jews opened up on mercilessly with fire. 
we uh, went out near the air, Hyper Airport, what we call the Trade School Bullet, and uh, we could see these poor old families, convoys of them, Arabs, cars and vehicles all going up to Lebanon. Very, very sad. احنا رحنا صرنا نجيب بالبواخ بالمراقب مراقب نجيب ناس من من حيفا على عكا اليهود عندهم زوارق حربيه يضحكوا علينا يضحكوا انه شو يعني طلقتين ثلاثه بنروح له شيء كذا prior to the war Haifa had been home to 70,000 Jews and 65,000 Arabs. By May, all but 4,000 of the Arabs had fled the city. We wanted to intervene in it, but we weren't allowed to. As simple as that. Simple as that. The Arab city of Jaffa would be the target of the next Zionist offensive. Jaffa was immediately adjacent to the Jewish city of Tel Aviv and home to the other major port in Palestine. When the clashes started, nobody was prepared to fight in Jaffa. No arms, no munition, no administration, no leadership, no organization. يدخل الجيب في وراء أربعة مثلا جنود أو عسكر أو المهم محهم أسلحة كان في منهم يطلق النار عشوائي على الشعب اللي في الطرق يعني هيك أينو الخيم لبيت سفر بخزغيم أينو الخيم ليادة كيروت كده يعني يومرت خلو لي يبقى והייתה פגיעה אחת ישירה בבית סמוך אלינו, שם נהרגה אישה ונפצעו כמה אנשים. וזה היה קרוב לחג הפסח של 48, אז פינו את כל השכונה וגם אותנו. On the 25th of April, the Irgun launched a major offensive on Jaffa. It had been two weeks since Irgun fighters had committed the massacre at Der Yassin. I was a company commander on the attack of Jaffa. 600 warriors we were in all. The first two days, it was a chaos. Nearly all our neighbors left. I was 16 years old. I told my father, I'm not leaving from here. Why? I'm not leaving from here. We stay here. Either we die here or we live here. On the first day of the attack on Jaffa, the Irgun commander, Amichai Paglin, had made his objectives clear. To prevent constant military traffic in the city, to break the spirit of the enemy troops, and to cause chaos among the civilian population in order to create a mass flight. On the third day, he succeeded. Four or five mortars were down in front of our home, in the old city of Jaffa. Then my father told me, what are we waiting for? It's only a matter of weak time. We can go, we come back. The people of Jaffa left half by force, I would say. The Etzel used to bomb Jaffa again and again and again. People ran away. We also told from mouth to ear that if the Jews will enter, it will be a terrible slaughter. So they ran away. <laughs> It's not easy. 
when you found yourself in a moment, in a moment, losing everything. Your family, your home, your business, your school, your past, every, everything, everything, completely, and thrown out in the street to nowhere. صار كانت في قيادة هون من العرب أجوا قعدوا يتضاربوا هن وياها القيادة انهزمت وإحنا ظلينا في البلد ورافعين أعلام بيضة تنظل بعد ما راحوا هذلاك طوقوا البلد وقالوا إذا واحد بيبقى فيها بنطخه يا بنحبسه واللي وجدوه ظل بعد المسافة اللي أعطوهن إياها طخوه والباقي أطلعوه العاجز حملوه بالسيارات ويرموه على القرى بعدين أجوا مسكوها وهدوها إياها جابوا الغام وجابوا أشياء وصاروا هدوا في البلد By mid-May, 250 to 400,000 Arabs had fled their homes Between a third and half of all refugees who would leave Palestine during the war left before the British completed their evacuation on May 14th. That same day, the Zionist dream became reality as David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Jewish people in Palestine, read the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> With the declaration of the state, the Jews of Palestine would now be called Israelis. The Arabs of the country would continue to refer to themselves as Palestinians. Massive celebrations broke out in Tel Aviv, but many Israeli fighters had a different reaction. In the declaration of the state, I was not happy. I did not dance. Yes, and I said, it will be trouble. With refugees pouring into their countries, Arab leaders could no longer ignore the crisis in Palestine. The day after the British left, units of the Egyptian, Jordanian, Syrian, Iraqi, and Lebanese armies entered the war. There was a strong sense of fear we knew that we don't have airplanes, we don't have tanks, yet. This week's news includes pictures in Palestine taken from the Arab side. They show troops of the Arab Legion consolidating gains in a Jewish district of Jerusalem, where much of the heaviest fighting in recent days took place. Fires continued to add to the very considerable destruction already caused in the city, and at this time, at any rate, there seemed little prospect of calling a halt to the Arab-Jewish war. It turned out now that there was one period in the war in which the Arabs had a uh, superiority of power, and that was in May, when the Arab armies invaded Palestine and had weapons for which we didn't have an answer. But the general notion among Israelis, especially veterans of my age, age that the whole war was like that. But if you calculate, as we did, the number of troops just in the Palestine theater, there are more Israeli fighters than there were Arab fighters. The armies that these states had were very small, and they were poorly trained, because these states had been occupied by European powers, either the British or the French. The best troops were the Jordanian troops, the Arab Legion, Abdullah of Transjordan had made a deal. He wanted the West Bank, what had been allotted to the Palestinians in the UN plan, he wanted that for himself. And he promised then not to attack, and the Zionists agreed with that. Except for the battle for Jerusalem, which was to erupt, the Israeli army didn't really have to worry that much about a Jordanian attack. They could focus on the Iraqis, the Lebanese, the Syrians, who themselves were divided, and the Egyptians, 
I don't think any one of the military commanders in the Arab world had any illusion that they would be able to defeat the Jewish state. But of course, to the public, they told that they would take Tel Aviv and so on. But I think that they were, they were quite realistic people and they knew the balance of power as anyone else among the leaders knew. The intervention of the Arab armies did not stop the attacks on Palestinian Arab towns and villages. The next day, Israelis began their final assault on the town of Acre. Palestinians poured into boats to flee the attack. It was the first time I saw the ugly part of the war. Until then, war was dangerous, war was. But it was not ugly. We went moving around this village, and the door was open, and we entered. Under the table, there was a pair of small shoes. They were eating, and then somebody told them to go away quickly. He didn't have time to put on the shoes of the baby. This part of the war, I have seen it the first time. It's not a war of soldiers, it was, it's a war of people, of children. And I started crying. The child needs his shoes. We need to, to send the shoes to the child. Where can, can he be? Israel's Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, went to Operation Danny headquarters to meet with its commanders, Igal Alon and Itzhak Rabin. They asked Ben-Gurion what should be done with those who remained in Ramla and Lidda. According to Rabin, Ben-Gurion waved his hand in a gesture that said, drive them out. Shortly thereafter, Rabin issued orders for expulsion. Well, they, they came into each house at, at, an, at gunpoint, you leave. Each family was taken outside their houses on the street and then we had to walk into sort of gathering areas. Prior to the Israeli attack, 50 to 70,000 Palestinians were living in Ramla and Lidda. Now, only hundreds remained. They took the elder member of the family. He was maybe at the time, maybe he was 70 years old. And the soldier took his wallet. I remember this very, very well. So anyway, they took more than the wallet. They took everything. In the north, Israeli units launched Operation Dekel. The main target was the large Christian town of Nazareth. But like most Israeli operations, Dekel also targeted Palestinian villages nearby. Soon after, Israeli troops captured Nazareth. 
The next day, the Israeli army issued an order to the commander of Operation Dekel to expel the population. The commander was actually a Canadian World War II veteran, Ben Dunkelman. He had flown to Israel in the spring of 1948 to fight alongside fellow Jews. But Dunkelman reported being shocked and horrified by the order to expel the people of Nazareth. He refused to carry it out. There were two problems for that operation. One was Nazareth was full of refugees from villages that were already evicted. So the military commander realized that he would have to evict not only the people of Nazareth, but twice the number. He also realized that the world was watching because of the uh, sacredness of the city to the Christian world. Dunkelman's argument convinced the Israeli leader, David Ben-Gurion, to allow the people of Nazareth to stay. However, Dunkelman was removed from his newly appointed position as military governor of the town. And when Ben-Gurion later visited Nazareth, he looked around in astonishment and asked the Israeli officers, why are there so many Arabs? Why didn't you expel them? They usually surrounded the village and left one road open, prevented people from going in any direction except in one direction toward the closest Arab state. And we came, wonderful, you came just on time. And tomorrow we are showing out the Arabs from Beersheba. You are going to help. Of course, I'm going to help. The next day I got our gun. We prepared several buses. I think there was 10 or 12 buses. And we called all the Arabs from Beersheba to come to the buses. And I was standing like everybody with a, with a gun, so nobody will try to run away, and all of them will go into the cars and go to Gaza. And they are in Gaza, in Gaza today, until today. Nobody had an idea that this is, this is a complete expulsion. It's a kind of war which will stop one day and you go back home. Wars happened all over the world. Towns have been occupied. Countries have been occupied. When the war was over, people got back home. Why should we be different? Were this just an accident of war, then that accident of war would have been repaired within a few months of the implementation of Plan Dalet by the return of these people to their villages. They were not allowed to return. شو بدنا نعمل؟ الله أبوي لأمي قال لنا نازل على فلسطين كيف بدك تنزل؟ قال لنا نازل ونازل على الكابري إذا رجعت بعد يعني 15 يوم رجعت ما رجعت بتكون القتلة Then one day we got an order to take the jeeps and spread out and to shoot every Arab whom we saw coming in coming in, coming back. And uh, this is what happened. The thinking behind this was, 
political, but essentially strategic. The Arabs, refugees who had been fighting, they were the Palestinians who had been fighting against the Jews. And they said, if we allow these back, they will overwhelm us as a fifth column, or they will overwhelm us demographically. In other words, there will be hundreds of thousands of additional Arabs, and they will become a majority or close to a majority instantly if they return. So the Israeli cabinet decided not to allow them back. We now must conclude that there was a recognition, at least on the part of that early Israeli government, that the displacement of Palestinians was necessary for what they probably viewed as the viability of their state. For me personally, it took the shape of an inner decision of myself. You wanted a war, okay. Now you run away, you'll never come back. So the, the notion of having this land empty of Arabs was already part of my life. In 1947, there had been between 500 and 700 Arab villages in the area that eventually became Israel. When the dust of the war settled, all but around 100 had been emptied of their population. Seven to 800,000 Palestinians had fled their homes, about eight out of every 10 Palestinians who lived in the area that became Israel. For decades after the war, the Israeli government claimed that they bore no responsibility for the flight of the Palestinians. Many Israelis still make this claim. We never wanted them to leave. Nobody told them to leave the area or otherwise. Don't tell me that nobody was forced to leave home. Everybody was forced to leave home. There is consensus on the fact that there was a large-scale displacement of Palestinians. There is also consensus on the fact that this displacement was forced. Some people fled out of fear. Some people fled because there were massacres. Some people fled because rumors were spread about massacres. And some people fled because they didn't just flee, they were actually actively expelled at gunpoint. All of this happened. What remains is the question of whether there was a plan of ethnic cleansing that was designed ahead of time and then systematically implemented during the 1947 and 48 war. And on this question, historians are divided. Now, the Arabs always maintain propagandistically it was a big expulsion. The fact is that most people simply fled the battle zones. In other words, the Jews attacked the militia bases, and during the attacks, or in fear of the attacks, even before attacks occurred, Arabs began to flee. I don't know how much we should, how much hangs on this. You know, either way, the tragedy is clear. You know, what historians do know, and that there is no doubt about, is that the war through which Israel was born was a set of events that, with the same breath, were the destruction of Palestine and the displacement of at least three quarters of a million Palestinians. That is uncontrovertible. I think that when we talk about the refugee problem, it is not so much important whether we chase them or they run away. It's not their fault that they wanted to run away after the Racine and the fear of war. I mean, every citizen would run away. So it was not that they deserted their home. They did not deserve. They were forced to leave because of the war. And in those places where they didn't know, didn't do it, we chased them out, like in Lord and Ramle. You have to, to understand that, for instance, the Jewish villages were spread all over the country, from the Negev to the Galil. You wanted to be connected, to, to make them one unit. But of course, everyone wanted to get more, uh, more land. The fact matters that these people were suffering tremendously as they were running away. The thirst and hunger 
and in the great heat, children were abandoned. And then later in the refugee camps, when they came up near Ramallah and suffered for many years and are not terribly happy even today. That doesn't mean that I think that they should come back to Olod. As I full-heartedly agreed that I would shoot at them if they come back in, uh, say, October, November 1948, I don't think we will need to shoot at them. But Israel cannot afford to take back millions of Palestinians and remain what it is today, a state in which I want to live. If you read the literature on ethnic cleansing in other places, you see that usually the idea is to force people to flee rather than to waste energy in, uh, in taking them one by one, put them on buses and lorries and so on. So usually what you want is to intimidate the population, make it flee, and, and, and by that you achieve your goal of a massive displacement. displacement. For me, one of the most shocking as an Israeli was born here. The most shocking Israeli decision, I, I don't think I've recovered since I first met this decision in the archives in the 1980s. In July already, 1948, the Israelis decided to demolish the villages so the people would not say that they can come back because there would be nothing to come back to. How people who survived the Holocaust could do such a thing, for me, is an I must, say, I must say, it's a riddle I haven't solved until today. How could they decide in July 1948 to go to 500 villages with bulldozers and tractors and wipe them out? On the 11th of May, the United Nations formally recognized the state of Israel. It was a feeling of creation. I saw it a lot. The United Nations Partition Plan had allotted 56% of Palestine to the Jewish state. As a result of the war, the state of Israel now covered 78% of the land. All of Palestine, except an area around the west bank of the Jordan River, including East Jerusalem, and a small strip of land around the town of Gaza. So what I say, Gaya, עצום, היה בלתי נתפס. איזה ארץ גדולה קיבלנו, או כבשנו, או, או, או הכירו בה. There will be a state, but state is, 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 is not always a great thing. Uh, fighting for a state is much better than to have a state. In the beginning, we were very happy about it. But after a short time, I started being not very happy. Where are they? Palestinians. Are they coming back? Are not they coming back? What will happen now? Here we have these two things intertwined with one another. The realization of a dream and the destruction of a society. And the most horrible thing about it was when you know, the war started and the, the Arabs were thrown out of their villages. Not one kibbutz said that they don't want to take their land. Not one kibbutz. Everybody was very happy to steal their land. يعني أكبر من مأساة إني أترك بلدي وملكي وأرضي وبيتي وأطلع منه مشرد لاجئ هاي أكبر مأساة. Imagine yourself if you are living in your home suddenly you find yourself only with a shirt nothing more your past is denied they say there are no Palestinians nobody was living here. It 
לא היו אפשרויות רבות. זאת אומרת, זה היה או אנחנו או הם, זה ברור, כי אם הם היו מנצחים, לא היינו אנחנו פה. ו... ועשו, וכל נסיגה הייתה יכולה להיות סוף של מדינת ישראל, זה לא ש... אז זהו, אז אנחנו לא היינו, ידענו שהם מסכנים, שהם דפוקים, אבל חיינו עם זה. אני לא יודע אם כולם ידעו, אני ככה הרגשתי. In addition to the original 700,000 Palestinian refugees of 1948, another 300,000 became refugees as a result of the 1967 war. Today, these two populations and their descendants number upwards of 6 million people and constitute a majority of the Palestinian population. Roughly one-third of them still live in UN-administered refugee camps in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. From the very beginning, the Israeli government tried to obscure its responsibility for the Palestinian exits. As early as August of 1948, while the expulsions were still taking place, the Israeli foreign minister was writing a letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations, in which the myth was already evolving. He was telling the Secretary General of the UN that Palestinians had left on orders from local commanders and from the Arab higher committee. Of course, later on, Zionist uh, propagandists elaborated on this and developed the entire myth that the uh, Palestinians had not been expelled. Indeed, they had not fled. It was part of a Palestinian conspiracy on orders from the Arab higher command telling their people to leave their homes, thus exonerating the Zionists from all guilt. For nearly 40 years, Zionist myths about the Palestinian catastrophe have, have been accepted in the West as truth. But recently, historians researching among Israeli state papers and in the archives of the UN have concluded that the vast majority of Palestinians did not leave voluntarily. There were no Arab radio broadcasts telling them to leave. They left either through fear of massacre or as a direct result of killings and forcible eviction. Israel bears historical responsibility, not only for driving the Palestinians out, but also for preventing their return. Somebody that the state identifies as a Jew living in Canada or Argentina who has no organic connection to the country is entitled to come and live and be given a home, have access to land, be given financial support and gain all the rights and privileges of citizenship. Whereas a person born in the country, who's Palestinian, whose uh, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were born there, has no rights whatsoever. That's what a Jewish and democratic state means in practice. The Hot is an organization, uh, Israeli organization, founded uh, some seven, eight years ago uh, by Israeli activists. Most of them are uh, Israeli Jews working on the Nakba, because we believe that uh, unless uh, we acknowledge it and take responsibility for the Nakba, there will never be, there is no uh, possibility for reconciliation in the future between Israelis and Palestinians. There may be peace, some political agreement, but uh, real reconciliation, there will never be unless Israelis are taking responsibility to the Nakba. אהההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההה
Israel now controls nearly all of historic Palestine. Here's the question. Was the establishment of the State of Israel so important that no matter what price Palestinians had to pay for it, it was worth it? Or was there something fundamentally wrong with a project that can only be realized by displacing hundreds and thousands of people? If the establishment of the State of Israel was a historic wrong, then the question now arises, how does one redress this wrong?